Good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Tolkoff, and I'm a board member of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. We're delighted to welcome you to this third program of our Workplace Matters series, which explores contemporary issues in industry in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. For those of you who are not familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, our museum is inside a 19th century oyster cannery. And we're located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We're dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Programs, programs like this are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you're currently a supporter, thank you. And if you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org. Your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're looking forward to tonight. This evening, the BMI is pleased to partner with CDM. CDM has recently released a report, Breaking the Shell, that explores issues faced by migrant workers in Maryland's crab industry. We can share a link to that report in the chat. Thanks to the CDM staff for their help organizing tonight's presentation. A few logistics before we begin. This discussion is being recorded and will be posted on the museum's YouTube channel in the coming days. Your camera and microphone are turned off, but we welcome your participation. Please use the Q&A feature along the bottom of your screen to submit questions to the presenters. Let us know if you're having any technical difficulties through the chat function. We anticipate this discussion will wrap up by about 8 p.m. Tonight's moderator is Lindsay Baker, the Executive Director of Maryland Humanities and co-founder of Baker Cruise Services. She has a master's in history and museum studies from the University of Delaware and a bachelor's in history from Goucher College. Lindsay will introduce our panelists and take your questions. Now I'd like to hand the floor over to Lindsay. Thank you, Phil. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I think this is going to be a great conversation, very interesting, and I think we have some passionate panelists, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing what they have to say. We have three separate panelists today. Amelia Guevara is a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Maryland. I'm not gonna read the full bios, they're in front of you. Soma Guzman is a social justice attorney at Centro de los Derechos del Migrante and I hope Soma corrects me if I messed up there. Um, and Aubrey Vincent is the sales manager at Lindy Seafood um, located on Hooper's Island. So I am excited to hear from each of our panelists um, a little bit about the overview and how they come to this topic and their area of expertise. And I am going to start with Soma. Thank you. Uh... Thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, Centro de los Derechos del Migrante, otherwise known as Center for Migrants' Rights, is a national nonprofit with offices in Mexico and here in Maryland. And for the past 15 years, we have been advocating for migrant workers. So these are workers that come to work in the United States with a temporary work visa. And just in 2019, here in Maryland, there were roughly 11 to 12,000 workers with a temporary work visa. Uh, these are workers in agriculture, seafood processing, research, higher education, landscaping, just to name a few of the industries. And there are many different types of temporary work visas. But tonight we are here to discuss uh, crab pickers, the crab pickers in Maryland's Eastern Shore. And, and these crab pickers are under the H-2B non-agricultural visa. So CDM works primarily with workers from Mexico. We provide outreach, education, tools to empower workers to assert their rights, uh, know how to navigate these programs. We also provide legal services and any other resource needed to ensure that they know their rights and what to do in case something does not go well once they are in the United States and far from home. Uh, and one particular group that CDM is very, very close with are the uh, migrant worker women. These are the crab pickers that come to Maryland season after season. Many of these women have been coming to Maryland's Eastern Shore for decades. Um, and so our relationships go far. Um, and I would say that they have been going strong for more than a decade since the pu first publication of um, Pick the Park. 
which was our report in 2010 detailing the working conditions of, of this group of workers. So breaking the shell comes 10 years after that report. And with that report, we wanted to see what, um, what had changed, what had not changed, and where is there room for improvement in the working conditions of these women? And that report, the research, the work that went into the report was um, done in collaboration with the American University College of Law Immigration Clinic and also the uh, Georgetown University Law School. And when we started, when we embarked on this research, um, which involved a um, number of surveys on uh, the Eastern Shore, we never thought that we would be releasing this report in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, we never thought that the that 2020 would be such a a tumultuous year for so many workers, for families, communities, everyone. Um, and as we saw, as we've been seeing the pandemic just evolve, we've also seen a high number of workers throughout the world um, that have contracted the virus. And we, our position is that the time is now to seek better protection, strong protections for the workers that are at the front lines, right? The, these essential workers. So I'm very excited to be here tonight and I'm really looking forward to the group discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Salma. Aubrey, can you go next? Sure, sure. Um, so my name is Aubrey Vincent. Um, I handle all the sales and I am also um, one of the owners of Lindy Seafood. So we have been a participant in the HGB program. We actually are a crab, crab processor um, in Dorchester County on Maryland's Eastern Shore located in Fishing Creek. Um, we've been involved with the HDB program since 1995. Um, that was the first year we utilized the program for seasonal workers. So um, much like Solma described, the majority of my workers have been returning to work for our family and our company now, some over 20 years. And so um, it has definitely been um, a very important part of our business. Um, the people in this call that maybe aren't familiar with the area that I'm located in, Dorchester County is a basically small rural county, um, generally low income. Um, one of our major industries in our community are fisheries, um, primarily crabs, um, fish, oysters. So where our factory is located is um, called Hoopersville um, or Fishing Creek is the actual technical address. But where it's located, um, census data tells us there's not even enough people to fill the jobs that are there. So that was kind of how historically the H2B program came to be and how so many Mexican women ended up working down in Fishing Creek. So the majority of the um, industry is staffed by Mexican workers through the H2B program. So as far as myself and my experience is concerned, I have been interacting with H2B workers and participating in the program now essentially my entire adult life. So I am the um, liaison for all of my workers. I coordinate with all of my workers and have personal relationships with all the workers. So a lot of the issues that are discussed in this particular report, familiar with, with discussions, not necessarily with people that work for us, but people in the industry. Um, I've also been on other discussion panels and worked with other people on trying to make sure that the program is the best that it can be for the people that I care about and the people that participate in it. So that's kind of a little bit about kind of what we do and where we're at. So pick crabs, but it's definitely more complicated than that. Thank you, Aubrey. Mm -hmm. Amelia, can you join us? Certainly, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate in anthropology. Um, really focusing on medical anthropology, really the study of how illness and health are shaped, experienced, uh, and understood, you know, based on global forces, um, historical and political forces, and, and the pandemic certainly is one of them. Um, so my particular work uh, focuses, my ethnographic uh, transnational project connects um, two rural receiving and sending regions, so the eastern shore of Maryland, or Chester in particular, um, with Chapulhuacan Hidalgo, uh, where many of these women are from, this region in particular um, straddles Hidalgo and San Luis Potosí, which is um, a very 
well known region for its music and for its cult its culture and food um, called the Huasteca region. Um, so I was in this region and I was looking more at the relationship between transnational HTP migrant Mexican women, labor migration, and chronic illness uh, as a medical anthropologist. Um, so between January 2018 and, 20, and April 2019, I uh, conducted um, many interviews, about 80 interviews, uh, to kind of look at how feminization of labor migration affects women's health, understanding how living kind of in this liminal position of circular migration places women uh, in social and economically precarious situations um, that could affect, may affect agency, well-being, health, um, and really examining individual understandings um, and the kind of regional specific variability of like of chronic illness, um, their understanding of the causality, of the treatments, and prevention. And so I, the main participants in my project were Mexican migrant women their families, community members, medical professionals on both sides of their migratory journey. Um, in Mexico, I um, conducted um, my research by visiting local clinics, churches, community uh, meetings, informal gatherings, weddings, funerals, observing uh, medical practitioners, and engaging with local chronic illness support groups. So I lived there um, uh, for approximately a year. Um, and then I traveled to the Eastern Shore, um, where I also lived. Um, you know, my methods include um, participant observation, formal and informal interviews, um, working alongside uh, uh, migrant clinics, um, and kind of understanding how um, you know, these outreach encounters uh, affected women's health. And so, uh, I spoke with HTV workers living and working in these uh, populated areas. I visited women daily, accompanied them on daily errands, doctor's appointments, um, and of course a migrant clinic. And of course I spoke to uh, owners of um, the houses, including Aubrey. Um, so it was really nice seeing you, Aubrey. Um, these, this ethnographic project really provided valuable information about how chronic illness uh, is present and not well understood. Um, as well as invisibility of disability, which is, you know is exacerbated by you know the constant movement of migration um, and how you know women and, and their families negotiate identities and reject or accept their designation of being chronically ill or the idea of being disabled for life um, in um, its many different forms. And of course, I also trace um, some of the you know. Um, issues related to poverty, domestic violence, and femicide that they leave behind but at this, in Mexico, but at the same time um, deal with their own mental health and medical crises in the U.S., uh, as well as some kind of more global, um, these, for, these larger forces of state sanctioned violence and kind of symbolic oppression toward Mexicans um, in kind of a rural, um, Republican stronghold of the, of, you know, the very democratic state of Maryland. Um, and so I'm looking at like how gender, age, uh, and class and sexuality, um, how women make sense of, you know, these uh, different kind of obstacles in their lives. So that's my work in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. Um so I want to invite our participants to put questions into the Q&A um, or directly into the chat. I'm going to be monitoring both. Um, and with that said, I'm going to make an assumption about our participants and say that um, it's possible that not everyone is in expertise in immigration, um, in immigration issues. And some people, even though they might know one piece about immigration, don't know the full picture because it's just a very complicated field to understand. So I'd like to invite uh, maybe Solba to uh, explain what an H-2B visa is and how it's different from other types of visas that people might be familiar with. Sure. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm going to try to explain this in a very simple manner, right? Um, we have, in order to work in the United States, the person needs to have work authorization 
right? And if you are a U.S. citizen, that's work authorization. You are authorized to work here legally. You're a U.S. citizen. If you're a legal permanent resident, you have work authorization. And then how uh, can other people access work authorization, right? And so they're, they're, that's the web of immigration law. Um, but the temporary work visa programs, that uh, grants a non-immigrant, it's a non-immigrant visa, and that is work authorization. The program is administered by the Department of Labor, right? The Department of Homeland Security has to like vet the applications of some sort. Then you also have the involvement of State Department. And the, the way these programs operate are that the employer, the business in the United States must demonstrate a need, right? And that is something that Aubrey mentioned that uh, if she can't find workers to fulfill these positions, then the employers such as Aubrey can tap into these programs, right? But there are certain uh, requirements that have to be met. So it's not just the employer says, I'm going to hire uh, workers from outside of the United States, right? They have to cross their, they have to cross ver various steps. Um, so there are petitions and there are job orders. Uh, the job order details the type of work that the um, that they need personnel for. Uh, and usually employers will work with recruiters or other type of agents to go about recruiting workers from them from outside of the United States. And then if that a recruiter is in the picture, a recruiter will go home, I mean, certain communities, uh, certain geographic areas. Um, they'll carry out the announcements, uh, so social media, some are in print. Um, and then there will be some sort of selection, recruitment, right, of workers uh, to fulfill the number of workers that the employer in the U.S. says that they need. And then this, this H-2B visa, which is like, like I said, one of many different temporary work visas, um, conveys this work authorization, this permission to come work in the United States for a certain employer for a certain period of time and certain requirements have to be met. Uh, the key thing about, something to keep in mind with these visas though, is that they are not, they don't give workers the freedom to change employment or change geographic regions once they're here in the United States. So their work authorization is dependent on their employment with said employer. Um, and at CDM, we have certain uh, viewpoints on that type of relationship, right? But that is something. So it doesn't mean that the worker can be in the temporary work visa, they come to the United States and they can go work wherever. They, are, they have to work for that particular employer for that particular period of time. And so that's the H-2B visa. And like I said, that's non-agricultural, which includes a lot of, uh, well, like I said, seafood processing, but landscaping are two of those industries. And I would also say that that is a that visa program, unlike the H-2A, which has been a lot in the news this year because that's the agricultural visa, farm work. Um, unlike the H-2A visa, there is an annual cap on the number of visas that can be granted under the H-2B program. So the, the federal cap is 66,000 visas. The H-2A program does not have an annual limit. Perfect, thank you. And um, my next question is about the impact that national politics has on these visa programs. I think that many of us who are familiar with um, immigration processes know that under the Trump administration, um, many changes took place that affected families um, in, in really deep ways. And I'm interested in how the H-2B visa program changed under Trump and what the expectation is under the Biden administration, if anything ha is already um, expected. And I invite you to unmute yourself and, and join in as you feel, uh, feel like you would like to do so. 
mail. <laughs> so I, I feel like immigration is one of those issues, anytime you're dealing with the federal government, it is incredibly complicated. And I would say, from my own personal experience, how length we've been in this program, I'd say the most unsettling thing that we're dealing with is uncertainty in every single way. So as an employer, uncertainty related to the caps, uncertainty related to program rules. Um, DOL, as mentioned earlier, is essentially the first agency you deal with when it comes to certifying the need for this program. And a lot of the positive things that I see in the program, I mean, the, the kind of one of the major initiatives in the HTB program is to hire American first if there are Americans available to fill that job and if that need can't be met after all recruitment options are exhausted then the option to bring in um, a seasonal temporary worker from outside the United States is the next possible step but what we've run into and I, I've noticed a lot of uncertainty too for our workers which creates a whole different issue as far as their safety is like we we're at the point and i've noticed it more to this recent administration where we can't even get reliable information online of who's approved who's not approved can we get people crossed i mean just this season i mean since we're focusing on covid we ran into a situation where we were issued an executive order that essentially said hey no more h2b workers then that was essentially backtracked so we we are dealing in an environment where we don't know our next step. And it's become incredibly difficult as an employer to really keep our workers informed. And that's what keeps them safe. Good information, good communication are the keys to keeping people safe and making sure that everyone gets what they need in this situation. We as employers just have not gotten it under this administration. Now, looking forward for a Biden administration, my hopes are more transparency, a actual plan, with a program to make it better all the way around. I think there's been discussions had over the past 10 to 15 years, and I know some of these things were touched on in the Pick to Part report and have been addressed with DOL. There are definite improvements that can be made to this program that can help everyone. And I think there's value there, and I'm hoping the Biden administration will be willing to tackle some of those things. We had hopes that the Trump administration would solve some of those issues in hopes of making a stronger program to help protect American workers and also protect migrant workers that come in through the program. That is not the reality of what happened. I think COVID pretty much sh just shined a huge spotlight on the fact that there were just so many issues with just communication and everything and trying to let people know what's going on. I mean, it's, it's, it's been tough. I mean, it's, I've got a lot of workers that don't know season to season whether they'll be employed and they know people that have been unfortunately taken advantage of because they thought there were job opportunities available in the U.S. and that wasn't the case and they couldn't get the good information that they needed which should be provided on ICERT and should be available to any job seeker to see whether that was a valid opportunity. I mean it's really created a huge, uh, it's just, I, I, I don't even know how to quite put into words just what an issue it's been because they refuse to do anything. <laughs> It's my personal feelings. They just keep kicking the can on it because immigration is something they, they are not passionate in solving or passionate in even helping with. They've really made it difficult from an American employer standpoint and from a migrant worker standpoint. Thank you. Um, Amelia, did you want to weigh in? Sure. Um, so I actually was in Mexico um, in 2018, 2019, and, you know, there was, um, you know, the visas did not go through that year. Um, and, you know, all the, you know, all the employers on the Eastern Shore, um, uh, you know, obviously had to deal with the repercussions of that. The, when, while I was in Mexico, um, you know, it was a, basically a waiting game to determine it was, um, you know, phone calls and WhatsApp messages being sent from you know this entire region to di from different from different women to different um to friends to other other colleagues and um and this wasn't just the women it was all also you know it affected their communities um and so this was something that um really ended up affecting um you know payments and and you know house payments and um affecting their health, uh, you know, no long, people were no longer, women were no longer able to kind of sustain their families, their own health care, their own um, visits. So on the individual level, it created pure chaos, um, as well as, you know, 
the frustration with the kind of xenophobic rhetoric that we continued to hear, um, which was clearly, you know, in their opinion, um, part of part of this kind of stop um, kind of chaos creating um, administration. So again, I'm going to ask um, maybe for some specifics about that, Amelia, in the in in case some people viewing are not aware, when you say that um, the visas, I think you said the visas didn't come through in 2018, 2019, does that mean for any of the workers from that region of Mexico that you told us about or for everyone? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Certainly. Um, so it wasn't, so it wasn't, um, I don't have a specific numbers, uh, but I think Aubrey may. Uh, but on the Eastern Shore, um, approximately when I arrived in the summer of uh, 2018, I think only a handful, so four or five of the houses had of the, I think there were approximately 10 to 15, depending um, on some of my numbers, um, five or six of the houses, probably half, had their, a, a fraction of their workers. Um, and so what happened was they weren't all going at the same time, which is, there's a usual kind of pattern to the way um, the, the women, you know, transition to the U.S. Um, usually it's in April and it's, it's in the early, in the early springtime. Um, and so some, some were given the go ahead to go and given the visas, some were not. So really, again, it was very piecemeal. It was very um, random as to who ended up um, where. And then some of the employers did not receive the same women that they did. So there is that kind of, these kind of gaps were created. Um, I think Aubrey has probably more numbers on that. Yeah, so in 2018, so what was mentioned earlier, there's an HTB visa cap. So the interesting thing about HTB, it isn't a proportional allocation. So the way it works, there's 66,000 66, visas divided into two halves. There's an April 1st start date and there's an October 1st start date. So 33,000 visas are allotted in the April 1 start date. What had happened was is there was an overabundance of applications. So I believe in that application period, I believe it was over 90,000 open positions were certified saying, look, there's a need here. So naturally, Department of Labor and its wisdom did a lottery to determine winners and losers. So basically what happened is people were left out. So you had employees that had been in this field doing this particular job, let's say with one company for decades, and immediate, they were planning on going to work, had plans, you know, their expenses, let's say their children's education, building a home, all of the normal decisions you would make based on continuous employment. Mind you, these people had been employed for quite some time, so there was no question whether the employer wanted to maintain the relationship. So they found out right before, I think we got notice because we were hoping for additional visas, March, our season begins April 1st. That would typically been when workers would begin working. Our company employs about 20%, 20 to 25% of the H2B workers that come as seasonal crab pickers in Dorchester County. Um, I typically hire over 100 people through this program. So we were, we did not beat the cap in 2018. So in March, I had to notify employees that had been working with me for quite some time that we didn't know when we were going to have visas. We didn't know when they were going to be able to come to work. Then we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, there was an additional visa release. We had to wait, I believe it was until July. We had to turn in a petition certifying we did, ha we did have the need, mind you. So my company is still trying to stay open. We're short staffed. We're trying to continue to buy product because if we are able to get workers to come in and process it, we still need to have those relationships intact to be able to provide the work. We have to certify that we can produce, we can provide a certain amount of work for all of these workers when they come. We guarantee 35 hours at minimum per week. You know, if they're going to be willing to come to work, then I need to be willing to say, look, I have this work available. Makes sense. Meanwhile, we're doing all of that. They do another visa release in July. I think they released, I believe it was 15,000. Mind you, that was more than what was needed, or that was less than what was needed. So again, missed the lottery had to wait until October to actually open our plan. So what happened was, is not only for us, but also for our workers, you have people that typically work, let's say eight months a year. 
and they essentially had to come in for four to six weeks and that was the entire season for the company and also for the employees it, it's kind of what i touched on earlier about the uncertainty basically we're all just sitting and waiting for the government to dictate whether we're going to be in business or not and whether we're going to have visas to offer and there's really been no rhyme or reason to it. And Congress has discussed kind of fixing the issue. They've tried to push, push DA, DHS to release additional visas. It's a, it's a Band-Aid strategy for a program that needs a lot of work. And that's essentially what happened to us in 2018. And it, it was tough and it was tough for our workers. I mean, I had workers that had to decide whether to keep their children in school because they really didn't know if they were gonna have employment. And so to Amelia's point, I mean, some have health concerns. They might've needed surgeries. They may have had other things that they needed to take care of. And they were, we basically were all in limbo. That's what happened. And that's what continues to happen unless they put some fixes into the H2B program. It's, <laughs> it's been, it's been tough. I mean, and that's, like she said, I mean, it was whole communities. I know um, Palomas is where a lot of our workers come from. In San Luis Potosi, and there were just for us 40 people or more in that community, essentially without six months of their income. It's a huge, huge effect. I mean, the ripples are just huge in our fishing fishing community. I mean, there was a huge amount of jobs that weren't there, just spending money and doing all the things that keep the economy thriving. So yeah, it had a lot of negative impacts for workers and also for Dorchester County as a whole. Thank you. So I see you nodding away. Did you want to weigh in as well? Yes, sure. Um, transparency is very important. Um, and I think, I think that Aubrey points a lot to the uncertainty, right? Um, I also see that there are a number of questions <laughs> in the Q and A. Um, uh, so, I mean, if I would like to address any of those questions. I don't know if you want to assign me a question, but um, they... Uh, I can they, assign, but you can also just pick one. That would be great. Great. I, I think that the uh, the big question, right, the impact of COVID and this year, I mean, in March, right, as we were starting to see the, the rollout of shelter-in-place orders, um, we as advocates immediately thought of, right, because we're thinking of, of the women that are about to make the trip to the United States. Oh. And, and tying also a little bit of, of another question that I saw in the Q&A about their, like, what do, like, the trip, the travel. So these women are recruited, they make the trip. Uh, Aubrey mentioned Palomas, that is a community, it's a rural community, and they leave Palomas, they usually go to Monterrey, uh, a major city in Mexico, for their visa processing. They remain there for a couple of days, usually three to five days. Then they take uh, roughly a three-day bus trip to Maryland. Um, with COVID, we were thinking, well, what's going to happen? I mean, how are you going to have social distancing on a cramped bus? How are you going to have social distancing uh, when they're sharing lodging in Monterrey because they have to keep their costs reasonable, right? So these these are these are low wage jobs, um, and then how are they going to have social distancing once they arrive in Maryland, right? Because as the as breaking the shell points out that there are a number of women that share limited housing space, um, and so what we what we did at CDM was we did a lot of outreach virtual. Uh, we messaged, spoke with the woman, uh, trying to figure out like what precautions they could take, but also trying to address these questions around whether am I coming to Maryland or am I not? What are the consulates doing? Because the consulates also, um, they shut down, right? And these interviews are in person, right? So there are, there were situations where workers not only crab these crab picker workers but other workers right that had gone to monterrey for uh, visa processing that ended up i mean finding doors were closed uh there was also a situation where i think one of the um uh, hotels there in monterrey had to close because it just had too many people and we have a pandemic and then people were left pretty much 
homeless, trying to figure out what was going to happen and what what is the U.S. government doing in all of this. Uh, so there is that uncertainty. Then the other element of, well, what would happen if a worker were to fall ill in Maryland, right? And there are issues there at play, like um, Emilia could probably talk more about the healthcare element of this, but many of these workers don't have access to healthcare. They live and work in remote areas. Um, Cooper's Island, I remember when I first drove out to Cooper's Island, it's a drive away. Um, it's a roughly 45 minute drive away from Cambridge. And Cambridge is where, I mean, I saw clinics there, it's like there are Walmart, several grocery stores. And they, these workers depend on their employers to get them to and from Cambridge to do their uh, weekly grocery trips, um, whatever other necessities they, they need, right? Uh, usually employers transport them by bus or by van or some other type of vehicle. But then that also raised concerns, right, about how is social distancing going to happen there, right? How are you going to ensure that that employers are abiding by these recommendations issued by the Centers for Disease Control, right? Because we saw a lot of the recommendations that came out, um, but what was actually happening? And, and yes, to answer one of the other questions in the Q&A, there were a number of women that fell ill. They contracted the virus, uh, I would say like around 50 or so. And that was around July. Um, public Department of Public Health was involved in all that. But, but these are workers that, these are women that depend on their employers for this health care. And also to, they have employers that are conscious and are taking their necessary precautions to minimize risks of contracting the virus. That's great. But in our advocacy, we're also calling for um, the governor, right, and our electeds to both at the state and at the federal level to look at ways to protect these migrant worker women, um, to issue some type of emergency temporary standard that would truly make these recommendations enforceable, right, to minimize risks and to prevent more people from falling ill. Thank you. That was a masterful pool of questions from the Q&A. And thank you, Aubrey, for answering them as you see ones that you can. Um, I see a couple of questions about the individual experiences of um, the women that are coming. And specifically, are they coming for themselves? Are they coming with family? Um, and what is their day-to-day -day like? Which I think Soma touched on a little bit, but I'd like to hear if anyone else has some context to add to that. Certainly. Um... I, so the women uh, are come by, uh, come by themselves, the H-2B visas. Um, there are no accommodations for families, um, extended families or children. Um, and so that is a, a key element of the vulnerability that is created um, once the women arrive in the U.S. Um, they do have, you know, uh, they, they live in, in communal housing once they arrive in the U.S. Um, usually, usually it's, you know, depending on how long they've come, you know, seasonally, um, they may, you know, know some of the women, but there are usually, you know, some people they don't know. But again, they do not come with their families. Um, and so this creates kind of long-term um, difficulties in kind of, um, the way uh, their social worlds work. Um, and that means, you know, losing out on kind of uh, not only community events and, and family gatherings and, and you know, uh, taking care of children, you know, what they call reproductive labor um, is passed on to other people. Um, so grandmothers and extended family usually assist in the raising of children, um, you know, and and so this creates uh, a lot of stress and kind of difficulty in their lives. <laughs> it's a little child there. Um, and um, so it's just something that is very um, stressful um, to deal with um, kind of in the long term. And usually as women do this their entire, you know, um, lives. So it's like 10, 15 or 20 years um, when, they, when they do that.
Thank you. I got a little distraction that appeared in the middle of that. Um, <laughs> does anyone want to add? I can only really like speak to our experience at Lindy's, but I know um, we were one of the factories. We also have male crab pickers as well. So I have some married couples, but there are not children that typically travel unless those children are U.S. citizens. There's not typically children that travel with their parents to come work. So a lot of I'd say that a lot of the difficulties that I think workers run into this program is that you're separated from your family. And a lot of times that's the motivation as to why they're participating in this program. It's much more than just work for one person. It, it has much more communal effects for all types of things. I mean, it's people just, they, they are individuals, but the family network is so much larger and that's ultimately why they're making the sacrifices they are. So they come here and essentially spend the majority of their time like Amelia said, a lot of times, 10 to 20 years, most of their working career is separated from their children. So a lot of times it takes the community back home to raise those children. So there's a lot of sacrifices that go into even making the decision to come participate in this program and do this job or any type of jobs that far away from home and your loved ones. Yes, and I would, I would also, um, on the family separation, uh, something that just came to mind in uh, some time ago, CDM uh, was uh, in a part of a documentary. It's titled Farewell Ferris Wheel. And it was on Netflix for a while. I'm not sure if it's still there, but it focused on the um, H2B visa and uh, carnival workers. But the what was very telling, um, the documentary shows the the man leaving his home because he's ready to embark on this trip to the United States to come out to Maryland. And he just seeing the, the sadness at the, like leaving his children behind, leaving his family. And then him also saying that he spends more time out here in the United States away from his, from his family. And then whenever he does go back home, it's that time is focused on like trying to repair and mend those relationships with his family. So I I will add the, uh, I'll see if I can find the link and I'll share that farewell fair as well. But that that like really, um, I remember when I first watched it, I'm like, that's, it's it's challenging, right? Because I, I have a family and I can't imagine being away from my family for such a long period of time, year after year after year. Here's a, a little bit of a shift in a question. Um, anyone can weigh in. What do you think people would be surprised to learn about in terms of the working conditions in Maryland's crab industry? I, I, I will tell you, um, so I'm from California and when I moved to Maryland, um, I mean, Maryland crabs, right? Um, and I looked at the crabs and I'm like, how in the world am I going to be able to pull the meat out of this thing? I'm like, I'm not a pro. And my husband is born and raised Marylander and he's very quick. Uh, but to me, the biggest surprise was finding out how little they're paid per pound. So, so women, um, we, in the report we detailed, it's anywhere from like, I think 350 to like $5 per pound. And there are many videos out there that show how quickly these women are able to pull the meat out of these um, these crabs. Uh, but there are also a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a toll on their body and on their hands, right? Because it's not an easy job. Um, I would go, I think I'll go next. Um, so kind of along the same lines, um, the physical toll, um, since I'm kind of focused on health, um, and the, you know, kind of compounded uh, occupational kind of stressors of, of working, you know, very long hours. It really depends, you know, th there seems to be kind of a range, um, and especially if there's more crab meat to be picked, you know, there is, there, you know, there's off, you know, overtime, um, um, you know, extra time to be worked. So it can be ranged from eight hours to 15 hours and what I've seen um, and, and heard from. And so that the stressors of occupational issues alongside chronic issues 
um, which you know are found the, cr the chronic illness and chronic disease um, you know one of the, the most difficult um, conditions that we find right now both in the US and Mexico um, in its populations um, you know just really how women kind of struggled through um, these very difficult conditions which you know include obviously picking you know um, you know very kind of unique finger work as well as um, the you know physically standing and kind of crouched for many hours and so these are things that um, you know I com you know created exacerbated a chronic illness and I saw and I saw almost a significant portion I can't give you a specific uh, amount um, of women who really had all sorts of different types of conditions which would which ranged from obviously diabetes to like constant rashes and, and kind of pain and gastrointestinal issues, vitamin D deficiency or not being outside. But, you know, it, it, it just uh, created uh, an immense amount of health um, conditions. Um, it's one of the things I was surprised about. We have a question. I think Aubrey might be answering it. I'm not sure. Um, but in the in the Q and A, is what would the average weekly salary be? So um, what I just I was doing a quick calculation. So our um, standard wage, not with overtime, is 450 per pound. So we have the way it works. We have a base hourly wage. Our production standard is three pounds per hour. Honestly, the majority of my employees are above that, but that is the standard. I think it makes sense to kind of look at it that way. Three pounds per hour at 450 a pound without any overtime would be $540 a week. Now, um, depending on their tax situation, they do pay taxes and things like that. There are certain exemptions in the agricultural program that are not in the HGB program. I have my own opinions on that. I think that's a discussion for another time. But I, the base, the gross wages would be $540 for that overtime. So typically, um, our schedule, our shifts typically run seven two at a maximum 10 hours, depending on the availability of crabs. So of course, it's typically heavier in the fall. Um, we do offer overtime. Overtime, of course, is time and a half. So that would be like $6.75 a pound. So my average wage right now, with the amount of crabs that we're picking in 40-hour weeks, anywhere from $5.40. And then I have some employees that make closer to over nine, depending on their productibility. Their Aubrey's freezing for me. Is everyone else still there? It really just oh. all depends. So that, that's that. I think is she back? Ah. You froze a little bit, Aubrey, but I, I think we got that they have overtime. Um, and it really depends on the amount of crab that is available for them to pick. Um, okay, Amelia, I'm going to jump to you. I think you might have some insight on the next question, um, which in my mind, you know, I'm a mom and I've got a family and I'm thinking, okay, if I make this much a week, how am I paying for housing? How am I paying for food? How much can I save to send home? So can you tell us a little bit about um, that portion of their lives while they're in Maryland? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um based on like my calculations and, and also the, you know, I, I, every person I interviewed, I asked, you know, how much they earned and how much they would save and how much, um, if anything, they could, you know, take home. Um, ultimately, with taxes and, you know, everything being taken out, the same kind of stuff that, for, that everybody uh, gets taken out, um, they would, including, so now they would pay for housing. Um, usually uh, employers would have housing for their employees, but there's also, it's a minimum, uh, mi minimal um, charge, but nonetheless, it, it, it eats into, um, you know, uh, their wages as well as food and kind of any other um, issues with their sundries or um, health. Um, and some, you know, some women, um, did have obviously some like very serious chronic issues. Um, ultimately, 
per week, they would pull approximately $150. Um, and so, and that's including like all their, you know, they, they would actually, they would actually be able to hold on to that. And then um, after even sending some money home, um, you know, they would, that would all kind of be sent home generally. Um, so $150 would be something maybe in, in excess um, to be put away in their bank account, which many of the women do actually have bank accounts. Um, and um, so it was, it was not very much. And honestly, um, more than they would earn in, their, in, in Mexico, because approximately an average wage um, in Mexico in that region is about $5 a day. Um, so it was an improvement, um, but considering, you know, uh, the kind of improvements they wanted to make um, in their homes, in their communities, it really um, it never really was enough. Um, and, and, you know, God forbid some sort of accident were to happen or family members became ill, like all the money that they saved would go to um, their families and um, you know, these kind of emergencies and the process would start over again um, the very next year, you know, just earning, putting away whatever they could. And I feel like the, the cycle we're describing too is a cycle that all low wage workers are, you know, currently that that is the cycle of low wage work. And that's what's gotten so difficult in like the community that we're in is on average, our job is higher than most of the entry level jobs that we have in the community. So all of our larger employers are paying less than what we're paying for H2B workers, which is an, a reflection of the community that we're located in, you know, outside of just the H2B program. I mean, it's the average starting wage is the absolute minimum where we are. Soma, did you want to weigh in on this? They, I mean, they, these are low wages, low wages. And as Emilia um, pointed out, um, and, and also Aubrey alluded to with low wage work in general, right? It's, these are workers that are either paycheck to paycheck, they go through great lengths. Um, and they're also one catastrophic injury away from either bankruptcy or just depleting their entire savings, whatever little money they have managed to save. Um, and and the, the other issue with these um, the crop pickers and workers that are in the temporary work visa programs is that they incur expenses to participate in these programs, right? Um, there is a prohibition on recruitment fees for the H-2A and the H-2B program. So the there can't be any recruitment fees of any sort. But we do hear of situations where there are still other types of payments happening or other types of fees being paid, right? Because workers have to remain in the good, um, on the good side for this recruiter, right? So there's there's that power dynamic and so there but there are other also other visas right where the workers pay several thousands of dollars to come to the united states to come work in the united states um, so we have very structural problems in terms of transparency in terms of enforcement and in terms of also um weeding out the bad actors right that that take advantage of people that are are struggling to make ends meet and they're trying to just be able to provide for their families agreed and i was gonna um point out too i think one of the great improvements that's been made in the h2b program specifically is transparency from the recruiter so each employer is required to sign agreements with a recruiter where they're not supposed to charge fees i think 
I think the most important thing that needs to improve there, in my personal opinion, is the communication part of it. If there's something that's happening outside of that agreement with the recruiter, if employers aren't notified, they can't weed out those bad actors, like you mentioned, that really they shouldn't be giving their business to. And if that happens enough where that communication takes place so they can stop doing business with it, that'll send the message that, look, as employers not willing to accept that, because we're under the impression that that's the message that we're sending. But I don't know if that's necessarily always the case in Mexico, if that conversation isn't happening with the employees, because I'm getting the face from the recruiter that of course we're not charging fees. But if they're doing it in the form of, like you mentioned, the report cosmetics or some other type of upcharge that isn't necessarily considered disclosable, then it makes it tough to really weed that out without having that open dialogue and communication. Thank you. I would say that there is, there has, I actually witnessed at least one, one case of, you know, kind of coercion. Um, and I mean, it was a very, cons it, at least the, the, the past certainly was very, um, there was a lot of kind of under the table um, payments um, from what I understand, at least in the last, you know, 20 years or so. Um, but you know, I did witness one incident um, in which, you know, that, you know, one of the recruiters, this is in a neighboring state, um, uh, kind of alluded to payments rather than, you know, outwardly saying it. Um, so this is something that clearly still goes on. Um, and I, you know, being kind of coerced. Um, and, you know, the, and, and the, the women that I um, like lived with and, and worked with, you know, they were, not interested in kind of blowing this up. You know, they were more interested in continuing to work. Um, they weren't gonna tell, you know, let anyone know, um, but they, you know, they understood that this was potent a potential problem um, that still continues today. Yeah, I think that's, that's the biggest frustration I see is, is the lack of willingness to want to stand up and say something about it because they have a lot of risk. Right, there's certain just inequities in the system at large that kind of create this environment where they're afraid to say something. And it's made it really tough, I know, on our side. I mean, I've heard horror stories from 20 years ago where they were paying absorbent interest to try and get here to work. Well, meanwhile, people were none the wiser. And it's kind of like, how do you how do you change that system so that there's strength in people being able to tell their story and what's really happening to them so we can actually change it. And I think that's that's been our biggest, or at least my first, I can only really speak for myself, is that I believe the system's made positive changes, but I don't, I think there's always room for improvement. It's very frustrating to me to hear that those are still things that people are having to deal with because it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And I, I think, I think some of the people, especially that are newer to the program, a lot of times are a lot easier for people to take advantage of. And a lot of that is that lack of transparency and direct communication that I see with this program, because year to year, it's a constantly shifting playing field of whether you have visas or not. You can't really build that relationship that helps protect people because they're able to get direct information. Yeah, it's, it shouldn't happen. It's just flat out wrong. Well, I am going to cut us off. This was a great conversation. Um, I am supposed to be asking one last question, so I'm going to slip it in real quick, um, Phil. I hope that's okay. And that is, um, if you each have a resource that you would like to share with the attendees where they can learn more or perhaps take action in some way, um, I would really appreciate you doing so before uh, Phil kicks us off and says thank you. Soma, do you want to start us again? You have one? Uh, I would say if, if you haven't read Picked Apart from 2010, please do so. It has a very extensive um, background. It talks a lot about the issues that we discussed today. Uh, but yeah, it's Picked Apart. Amelia? Um, I would suggest the website, well, it's an organization called um, CATA, El Comité de Apoyo de los Trabajadores Agrícolas, which means the Farm Worker Support Committee. Um, I um, had a wonderful experience and um, a lot of, you know, support from this organization and uh, uh, particularly from uh, Leila Borrero-Kraus, 
uh, who's particularly useful, helpful, and, and such a, a kind person. But the, the, the website is cata, C A T A farmworkers.org. Um, and its mission is to, um, it's founded by migrant farm workers and now expands to um, immigrant communities uh, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and the Delmarva Peninsula in uh, Maryland. I would suggest that website. Thank you. Aubrey? Yeah, I think both of the resources they suggested were great. Um, I know, and I honestly, I feel like a lot of times when it comes to these issues, a lot of people get their information off of Facebook. There's a lot of really good resources as far as farm workers, um, organization associations that really do a good job of putting a face to who produces our food. Okay, it's much more complicated than just, I go to the grocery store and I grab a thing of strawberries or even a pound of crab meat. I think it's really important to value who produces our food and how they get there to do it. And I think this is, the discussion we had today was great. And I think just even liking some of those pages so that it's on your feed, just so you can get an idea of kind of what that experience is like and what it what it really means, because it's a much more complex issue than we can even really touch on today. But I think just familiarizing yourself with the fact that there are people that are doing this type of work and their experience and why they're doing it is important. I think that's start on Facebook and like some of those groups, because I know it gave me a lot of insight when I first kind of came back to this after school, it really helped me really understand more so why people made the decisions they did and really understand where they're coming from. 